podcast download.com. Pontius Pilate, in my opinion, was probably in more dire straits than Yeshua, if you have the proper perspective. You see, Yeshua is the author and finisher of the faith, so he already knew the story of his life path from the beginning to the very end and beyond. He was the pen behind his own life, the essence behind the keyboard feeding into itself. Yeshua is a writer that stepped into his own creation as the main character of the tale, acting on most occasions as if he were subject to the reality of all the other characters. He knew himself, and therefore he knew the truth. Yeshua was in the unique and preferred position of having put down the tracks he was to walk well in advance of stepping into sloppy and linear time. For him, there really were no honest surprises, no moments of great decision as the other characters may have experienced, only the necessity to act as if there were, to add a little garnish to the meal of his play-pretend session for that particular incarnation. Like any experienced avatar playing the confident role of the hero, Yeshua knew that at the end of the day he could not be outwitted, outwhipped, outshined, or in any other way be defeated, yet felt no need to gloat about it often. Only when it was delightfully appropriate in the presence of those pretending to have power did Yeshua flaunt the might of his pen with just the right amount of sarcasm and disdain for those without truth but an illusion of power. Pilate did not have this advantage. He was clueless to the fact that he was just a character in the mind of the man standing in front of him, having been recently delivered to him by the religiously fearful among the Jews. In my imagination, when reading the gospel accounts of the Messiah for the age of Pisces, I don't really see Pontius Pilate as the villain that a good bit of people make him out to be. Maybe I'm wrong and maybe I'm right, but what makes more sense to me is that he was a character that was probably a little pompous, overconfident even, but underneath was generally a good person. Like so many other unconscious souls that live in this world, he was content to trust in a visible power behind him, in this case, Caesar. As Caesar's prefect in the stomping grounds of Yeshua and his posse, he was comfortable living the existence of a man under the illusion of power, as he told himself, as too many do, that he was just doing his job. Pilate had not even considered that there was a power far beyond that of Caesar, with all his armies and all his gold, silver, and precious stones, until the author of all that fictitious shit was standing before him. I picture Pilate in all that Caiaphas and his followers were throwing on the table the desire for the young revolutionary to be put to death. Having not been as intimately involved in the affairs of the community, he was ordered to reign over, in hopes of maintaining order, the death penalty for a free-thinking magician was a little too extreme. I imagine him shaking his head subtly at the request and turning his back to enter the judgment hall where perhaps reason could be found after calling Yeshua in for a chat. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked with little reverence as to the truth. I imagine Yeshua softly locking eyes with him, a slightly playful smirk on his face as he replied, Are you asking because you want to know or because that's what they say I claim to be? I see Pilate scoffing at the whimsical and cavalier attitude of a man standing in the balance of life and death. Hey man, does it look like I have a dog in this fight? Am I a Jew? Your own people and their batshit crazy priests are the ones that tossed you into my lap. What the hell did you do, dude? At this point, I'm pretty sure Yeshua gave Pilate a confident smile and said, I'm not from this planet, bro. My universe is so much bigger, and if my universe were able to fit in this planet, my people would stomp the living shit out of everything on it before they let the Jews get their hands on me. But my universe is not from this place. I believe at this point... Pilate probably felt a little disoriented as the possibility that there was something much larger than his illusory conceptions of time, place, and power were nudged at the foundations. Pilate could tell that this guy was a whole different level than the religiously fearful, the Roman centurions, the high priests, and he himself. This guy didn't believe in something. He knew something. What that something was allowed him to be silent at his trials and now delivering lines to the prefect of Judea with the swagger of 007. I believe the second time Pilate asked him if he was the king of the Jews, he genuinely meant it. I can see the same intensity of seriousness returning to him as Yeshua replied, You say I am a king. This is the very reason I was born, and it was for this fact that I came down to this planet to begin with, to not just talk about the truth, but to be the truth in motion. All those that live the truth feel where I'm coming from. At this point... The comfortable and secure belief in power given him by Caesar seemed no more tangible than air, as Yeshua introduced something to him that he had never given much thought to before, a concept that when raised stands as a threat to all things mortal men regard as powerful, and that is the truth. Power without truth is a dangerous machine with no empathy, compassion, or progress. Power without truth is just briefly successful decay. 
destined to be reduced to ashes and erased from the face of existence in due time. I imagine a slack-jawed pilot muttering the virgin question as he returned to the assembled mob of what is truth. After telling the high priest that he couldn't really find a crime that Yeshua had committed that warranted death, they were none too pleased with Pilate, and the tempers began to rise. Pontius was probably still lost at the sea of his psyche when his wife sent word to him with a warning to not turn over the Messiah no matter what due to her nightmares of doom if he did. And that further indication of troubled omens regarding Yeshua no doubt had him in quite the conundrum as he debated which would be worse, allowing a riot in the city occupied by his emperor's people that could boil into a full-blown insurrection, or killing the king of the Jews, and more than that, the king of a universe. One alleged king had Pilate doing the dirty work in Judea for him, and the rumored king of the Jews was putting his money where his mouth was and getting in the ditch with what he spoke out as his truth. Of course, we know how the tale goes, don't we? Pilate had the opportunity within his hands to actually exhibit true power and act in truth by letting Yeshua go free and letting the chips fall where they may. But he didn't. First, he compromised and attempted to find some common ground with fear. And as it always does, fear outsmarted the timid at heart. By putting the choice to free Yeshua or the robber Barabbas in the hands of the mob, a thief was let loose among them to roam and steal again. Then Pilate compromised by believing that the truth could be beaten, scourged, and therefore conformed to a more palatable truth than what it was before. That, too, was not enough for the mob of fear, because fear is a bloodthirsty creature, and it's only satisfied when life is drained away from the truth. Refusing to operate in true power, Pilate took the coward's way out and washed the opportunity in his hands away, and the king of the universe was condemned to die. I admit, that's a pretty sad story, but not so much for Yeshua. The sad part is that Pilate came so close to having his shot in the light, he had the pill of truth in his mouth, but he couldn't have the courage to swallow it and allow its effects to operate in the reality of consciousness that the author could operate in. The consciousness that we all can operate in. Pilate could have had this, but instead he tried to convert truth to triviality and disassociate himself from ever having come face to face with it at all. I am a writer. I've been one since I was born here, and long before that. I say that to subtly indicate that I am not from this place. If by some chance my words are inside your mind via the eyes, ears, or other, then the odds are you are on or near the same wavelength as me. Fun, huh? You have either realized you were on the hero's journey at some point, or have been through it so many times in so many different ways that you've transcended the trappings of most fellow travelers. You operate beyond the reality that most everyone else perceives and operate within. Your awareness is expanding to a bigger picture, a higher veil to be lifted, a frequency undetectable to the masses at the level of politics, pyramids, game shows, and of course the shackles of fear. You know your role within your story, but most of all, you keep the sacred truth hidden behind your lips. This is just a story. It is just a game within the mind of the all of existence, and within that game, you are more diverse than those stuck-in-walk-on parts. You, I, and Yeshua are actors who wear masks so well that sometimes in the past we too have lost ourselves in the roles we have played. We are observers, watchers, keepers of the balance in the universe, and when the need arises, we police the unruly of the karmic tides. We are the fulfillment of Yeshua's story in that all the things he did are at our disposal as well in some form or fashion. We are free thinkers, healers, leaders, revolutionaries, and ultimately the most precious of royalties. And like our predecessor, Yeshua, we wear the humble clothes of mothers, fathers, farmers, artists, singers, doctors, teachers, and of course, writers. When fully realized and connected, we are the unseen force interwoven in the fabric of native reality that guides and controls the story unfolding around us all. The keys to this kingdom are first given to us when we embrace the place of knowing the mind, not the pink and gray matter of the brain that only exists as a result of the will of the mind, but the mind of the universe that can isolate itself into an infinite amount of expressions and just so happen to choose each and every one of us. Doing this without some plot, of course, would be rather dull and as moot as if nothing ever happened at all without the injection into those expressions of free will, freedom to choose to know, and liberty to act through what we know. Choice is the method in which the game is played, and truth is the object of the game. Truth is the holy grail that we seek or have sought and intend to bring to others who have yet to win the game or even begun to play it. 
Everyone seeks power on some level. And most get the generic version without ever wielding true power found in knowing thyself and putting that into action with truth. The inability or unwillingness to walk in truth is the dividing line between what makes a Christ and what makes a pilot. A pilot goes down in history as a sub-character that lacked the ability to do what was right despite the resistance that may result from it. Sure, they may know what is right, and they may think what is right, but in the end those things are vapor and smoke by the law of what they do or do not. It's what we do that makes us who we are, not what we think or feel to do. Action is the chisel to the stone in our stories. Truth in action is the laser in the mountain, however, that will stand forever. I have no doubt that many people in the mob before Pilate and Christ thought and felt that Yeshua was innocent and should be set free. But none of them lifted a finger to prevent his alleged death. They offered no resistance to the machine of fearful power. This is the state so many are in today in this world we find ourselves sharing. As my personal evolution continues, the whole idea of this thing we call the, quote, truth movement has left a bitter taste in my mouth, much like the sensation of sucking on a coin as a child. I came up in it, through it, and can see from above it, and quite honestly, I'm not impressed with what resulted from its moving. I find that so many out there in the, quote, truth movement come to some conclusion that this planet is a prison, a people farm, or a system created and controlled by malevolent beings with unstoppable power. And the only escape is death followed by an obstacle course of theological babble. They rage and rage about all that's wrong in this experience and generate so much energy with surplus to the continuation and perpetuation of this abscess in thinking and being. They talk endlessly about chemtrails, pedophile rings, GMO this or GMO that, wars, politicians, and new world orders equipped with stormtrooper armies unlike George Lucas has ever filmed. They've inherited the can of fear from the generations before, caked age by age with more muck and mire, and kicked that bastard further down the road without thinking to the generation that follows. You never hear solutions because they don't have them, and you never hear a victory because fear is too profitable and the show must go on, which is why the whole position of this earth being a hellhole or some sort of plantation is just a big bucket of bullshit carried by the consciously weak. This world is, at worst, not a prison, so much as it may be rehab. It is a stopping point, the journey of the all, that is to rest and get its shit together for a little while before traveling on in existence. That's us, worst case scenario. God getting its shit together within a certain space and time. And after that, the world reveals that it is exactly what Shakespeare said, a stage with us the players. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the negative aspects of this world are not there. Rather, what I am saying is that they are easier to deal with than the masses think. We, as a conscious people, don't need to fight them, force them, or protest them so much. We just need to put the truth in action, and where we can or when we can, do the right thing, and let the chips fall where they may. The right thing to do is sometimes the dirtiest thing to do, by the way, and when it's done, it doesn't always appear to bring immediate order or justice in the universe. But, when given time to cultivate, it is revealed that the right thing, no matter how messily it may have been done, ultimately brings life into harmony. The truth is that sometimes you got to let shit get broken before you can build something newer, better, and stronger. That takes courage to do. And yes, it can be very frightful when those times arise in your life. The right thing always comes with risks. It always comes with chances of something being lost or taken away. Anything in this life worth a damn comes with risks. And let's be honest, so do the things not worth a damn. So, at the end of the day, risks are always going to be there, no matter what. And that being the case, why take risks to pretend playing it safe? Why be a walk-on part in the wall when you could play the lead role in a cage? And before you choose, remember that a cage can be opened much easier. As someone who for some time has taken great interest in the uprising of liberty-minded people that adhere to the philosophy of personal freedom without the permission of the state to express it, I see an obvious problem. I see that those who want it and feel it in their bones as the natural way of living are under the impression that freedom and liberty are ideals that need to be explained to those who do not before they can be enjoyed. What I mean is that liberty-minded people operate under the impression that a case must be made that is so universal and simplified that everyone else all at once gets it and we magically become free altogether. 
that is highly unlikely. After all, look at the state of the country that purports to be the embodiment of freedom and liberty and the government it has rusting along. I don't know of any fellow traveler that feels the government of the United States Incorporated is actually a representation of what the people want or desire, and the fact that it does way more harm than good is self-evident. With meaningless and destructive prohibition of plants, herbs, and oils that fill prisons with the victims of lawyers and judges who golf on the weekends together, to maniacal wars that grind up our youth like hamburger meat in all sorts of places around the world, the governments of this world are completely cancerous, and we all know it. But what are governments without people within them? They are not buildings, they are not rifles, they are not tanks or shackles and cells. None of those can do anything without people. People who, under the illusion of power, without truth, just do what they are told. They sheepishly respond in word or deed with, I'm just doing my job. Without those types of people, governments are just imagination, a thought field that no longer has to be acted upon or brought into existence by action. Revolutions of governments are no more bothersome than shifting your thoughts to the truth, acting and living in truth, and having confidence that by doing so, others will do likewise. When you are first or few in numbers, this doesn't seem so easy, and the threat of risk may cause you pause, and the cries of those without courage may force you to hesitate. But know then that the excitement of life is in that flutter of danger, and when you are a pioneer in an unknown land, it is the lamp under your feet to triumph. Mark Twain said, In the beginning of a change, the patriot is a scarce man and brave and hated and scorned. When his cause succeeds, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. That's as cold as the other side of the pillow right there if you happen to scoff at the few who are willing to take the first steps in new territory. Mark Twain is basically saying that if you think or feel the right thing, but wait for everyone else to do it first, you're kind of a pussy in his book. I heard a preacher once deliver a sermon where he depicted brilliantly the idea of Pontius Pilate trying to wash the blood of Yeshua eternally in the halls of hell from his hands. While he might have meant that literally, I think it is a good concept to extract allegorically. In shirking the call to know the truth and live in that truth due to the fear of risk, Pilate was a mechanism in the murder of an innocent man. Apathy and succumbing to fear is the murder weapon of life and living consciously. Pilate had his title, his legions, his palace, his armor, for a time power, but failed to utilize any of it when it really, truly mattered. The saddest part about that, for Pilate anyway, is that he didn't stop the eventual victory of the hero in any way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, his failing turned out to be another means to an end for the author of the tale, which aided in providing the climax of the resurrection and ascension of Yeshua into the greater universe of his making. I imagine as Yeshua the Christ ascended higher and higher, Pontius Pilate began to resemble more and more his true self by appearing only as a tiny speck of dust in the eye of the hero. I'm honest with myself in the fact that I'm an actor that wears many masks. I'm more able to accept this because I am indeed a writer that must give due diligence to the voices of characters that live within him and allow them to drive my vehicle from time to time. I think of all the people who were once in my life that I didn't think I could exist without, knowing full well that they are gone, some never to return, and yet I exist still. I look at those in my life now that will certainly one day move on as an eventuality and know that when that happens, I still will exist. I anticipate those I have yet to meet or put a face to, but know that even without them having arrived yet, my existence is still a certainty. I have been born countless times, died countless times, and smile at the intimacy of the Led Zeppelin lyrics, I am a traveler of both time and space, having had the opportunity to perform different parts in the stories of those I've come across. For every face and name, I have no doubt my character could be described in an infinite amount of ways. To some, I am a villain, a drunk, a madman, and a devil, while at the same time to others, I've been an angel, a teacher, a hero, and a friend. The light and shadow of action will always give the onlookers distinct and unique perspectives while you're in motion. At the end of the day, however, one's true nature is only revealed while alone, with oneself as the masks are carefully taken off and the reflection of self is seen. In that time of solitude, and yes, sometimes loneliness, the only thing that remains is the memory of not what you thought 
or felt with the players on the stage, but what was acted out. All of us are capable to be the masters of our own destiny and really revel in this beautiful gift of life. It was given to us as a playground for the purpose of enjoying experiences together, and that alone is motivation for getting a grip on it. It's the nature of things for there to always be a bully that comes onto the playground with us, and this bully is big, loud, and opposing him always comes with the risk of getting a shiner or two. It is the bully of fear, and most of the kids on the playground shrink and flee from its presence when its shadow falls on them, avoiding eye contact at all costs. But you know something? It's always the littlest and most unsuspecting kid in his path that pops the bully in the mouth one good time and sends an electrical current of courage into the collective consciousness of the others. When the stars of the bully are done swirling and the blackness of space clears up in his eyes, he sees a new reality he didn't expect. A playground of little kids that are no longer frightened and no longer going to put up with his shit. Perhaps this is another aspect of Christ's advice for us to be as little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven is filled with little children willing to punch a bully in his throat. And of course, we all know that little children aren't as mindful about washing their hands as pilots might tend to be, because for them, the dirt, sweat, and blood is just a part of the fun of it all. I'll leave you with this. Do the right thing, and let the chips fall where they may. Try this practice in deeds both small and great, and when you fail, acknowledge it and adjust your course. Don't shrink to fear, to tyranny, or the power of any other bully that may try to intimidate you into being mediocre. Don't throw your hands up in defeat, despair, or hopelessness when surrounded by the apathetically infected parasites of your life. Simply pick them off like ticks and find more agreeable fields to frolic in. Find other winners to play with. Find other revolutionaries, other visionaries, other lunatics that know and do rather than simply think and feel. Be the hero of your tale. Be the one holding the royal flush. Be the god aware of the mask it wears and prove it by right action. You do that, and I assure you, the all of existence will demonstrate that neither height nor depth nor life or death can separate you from its love. Stop asking what is truth, and declare to yourself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right, guys, so that concludes the um, 33rd podcast of the Downloaded Content Podcast first set, I suppose. You know, when I started DownloadedContent.com, it was... Uh, uh, intended not to have any kind of architecture or structure. It was just supposed to be kind of an experiment from the mind of an insane writer like me. Um, so the podcast is is evolving that way too. So I'm not quite sure if it'll be seasons or sets or how I'm going to do it. I guess I'm just going to go with wherever the universe kind of takes me with it. But uh, I ha I do hope you've enjoyed the um, the 33 that have been put out plus uh, the Jason Patrick updates while he was at trial. Um, and I appreciate you guys for supporting me like you have in this first year of the website um it means more to me than you possibly know because what i do at the website is is from the bottom of my heart um I hate it love it be offended be uplifted it is what it is so i appreciate you guys checking in on on me and my work from time to time so um like i said i'm going to be backing away from the microphone from this podcast and from other shows uh and working on those manuscripts to get them out to you in the meantime, you can support me by picking up my, my novel, Then Came the Flood, at Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com or any other major bookstore.com. And to get the second set of podcasts off the ground, you can go to Patreon.com forward slash DLC and become a patron of mine to help me create quicker content, better content, higher quality content. I would really appreciate that and it, you know, show me that you're digging what I'm doing. So... Until I come back for the, the second set of podcasts, I wish all of you well. And um, if you've heard me talk about the Canisense campaign and you need to get a hold of me, just uh, click on the Canisense Total Wellness page at the top of uh, the website and put your information in, and I'll get a hold of you as soon as I can. Please be patient with me. So um, until I come back, um, I hope all of you can catch up on the podcast that I have put out um, that maybe you haven't heard yet. And um, I'd love to hear from you. You know, Check me out on Facebook and all that other good stuff. So thanks, guys. I, I appreciate what what you do, which is show me your love in so many different types of ways, more than you can possibly imagine. And uh, I thank all of you. So until then, be well. <laughs>